a little here and a little there. Always, whenever I'm not looking, in the middle of the night, when we finally succumb to our yielding knees and rest, or in the morning, when I'm looking for something to eat. He pushes the partition I've made, supposedly by accident. He even coughs to cover the splash, but of course I know what's going on. I'm standing there as usual, with my back against the partition, knees slightly bent, and bang! He jolts and throws me off balance. And with every new push, he inches further into my space. The moment I realize, I yell and push back. But it gets tiring. I ran out of patience and give up. Let him have as much space as he wants, but he's going to do with it anyway. As long as he doesn't leave me with nowhere to stand, I'm happy with what I had. In any case, when the big one comes, all this will end. Like this woman is gathering wood every day or sometimes metal sheets of some sort. God knows where she finds them. She even brought in a whole door the other day. She has put together something that resembles a shack or a phone booth and she shuts herself in there. She's added some plastic climbers hanging from the ceiling. Why plastic? I ask her. It's not as if we don't have enough water to water them. I haven't got the time nor the will, she says. In any case, everything is temporary. It's true. No one's safe. It's a jungle out there. Fights everywhere. Bickering over whose is what. Only one thing can save us all. The big one. When it comes. If it ever comes. My grandmother used to tell me what her grandmother used to tell her. About how she was standing in the water when years ago the big one came. It didn't just come from the horizon as you would expect. It came from everywhere at once. A howling rain so dense you couldn't see your hand. Waters rising with rage as if the earth had opened her breast, finally ready to let out the cry that would destroy everything. And at the same time, the horizon turned back and a mile high wall of water started approaching slowly, like a promise. The waterfall of ages starting from the feet of an idol god and charging straight to all those below, waiting with open arms and knees bent from desire. Some mornings, especially when the sun is late to rise, a whisper stirs the water surface. Words dart past us, whistling that something enormous has appeared on the horizon, a boulder of water perhaps so dense that it seems opaque and final. But until now, Nothing has arrived but clouds, heavenly torns casting their shadows on us. And we, neither human nor beast, remain stranded in the shallows of the lake covering the globe. A lifetime of waiting, tepid and increased water barely rising to our knees, each one of us stubbornly confined to our allocated little square of water drowning in the melancholy of the desire for one more inch of space. I have worked on him. I think we caused a bit of a stir when I described you as necrohydrologist or hydrotherapist. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, an embalmer. Embalmer. <laughs> I'm not an embalmer, thank you. <laughs> No, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be able to respond to Andreas's amazing book, The Book of Water, um, or Book of Water, in fact. Um, and I was thinking, it sounds so different hearing it from your voice, so I'm kind of like still kind of reeling from the performance. But um, when you asked me to respond, I've been reading it a few times, and I was thinking a lot about how the book is these fragments of kind of ways in which water is entering into the unconscious as I read it. In your in your in your words, and uh, suddenly then last night, before tonight, I had a dream about water, and it was coming into my unconscious in a way that was very of the book, and I was dreaming of a kind of worldwide tsunami, so it's the big one that you describe in this book, in that particular chapter, 
and it was coming and I was carrying two toddlers and they were real life toddlers, my friend's toddlers, up into the dome of San Marco to, to be above in Venice, to be above the water. And then one of them was being typically difficult. And I, I won't tell the parents because I don't want them to think that <laughs> their toddler's still being difficult even in my dreams. Parents so. are here. <laughs> parents are here. But, um, but yeah, anyway, so there was something about these dreams and suddenly your book and the dreams that I read in your book are then entering into my dreams. But I wonder if you could describe something about how you wrote the book, and and whether they are that, dreams or not. I think quite a lot of it is, is at least is a, is a dreamscape. Um, May I say something about your dream? It's really interesting. Ivor and I met in Venice, and we have Venice in common. And Venice is a, yeah, it's, I think it's a, I mean, nowadays Ivor has moved away from Venice, and Venice is a bit emptier. Uh, although, you know, Venice would welcome that a bit, uh, a little emptier, but, um, but uh, not without Ivor. And it's interesting because we bonded over um, not just water, but a particular kind of water as well. I think it's this modernist water almost, this kind of, you know, green, sooty, cloudy, slightly smelly water. Uh, really, I mean, this is just a, the blue nods are just wrong. It should be water, like green and, and brown, murky brown <laughs> and, and all that stuff and deep and, and transparent. Um, and, um, and I think that's, that kind of water is the water, of, at least certainly the water of my dreams. Now this story uh, does come from a dream. This was a dream I actually shared with my, my analyst at the time. Um, about people standing in very shallow water, dark water, almost petrol, um, petrol consistency, and uh, and trying to survive in a sense. The partitions came, came, um, came afterwards. But um, I had a dream last night too. Um, the dream, the dream was that um, uh, the translator of the book who's here with us tonight, Sakis Kiratis, who's an old friend, uh, appeared in my dream in a blue jacket and a blue suitcase. And he sat next to me, and um, and I said, "What uh, what are you doing here?" And he said, "Oh, just a medical routine test." But of course, the blue, the idea of the blue or the water and the suitcase being something mobile, the water is something that you pack and go, or the you know the transience of the of the water um, is uh, is quite an extraordinary um, sensation. And, and in fact, what I wanted to do is capture m moments or boxes of water in each story. So the mm -hmm. way that this has been written was on a Greek island uh, where Elias and I used to spend uh, pretty much every every summer for uh, you know for seven years and we had this marvelous balcony overlooking everything but that island is tiny it's 40 permanent residents one taverna we, we shall never reveal the name and, <laughs> <laughs> and a huge like four kilometers beach and nothing else and so the balcony was right there on the beach and so I was writing a story every day for each person that we met or maybe an image that we that happened you know that I saw in the and then what we used to do at least in some cases we would read the story to them in the evening and measure the the reaction and so in a sense it's 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 and it was always in the morning with a bit of coffee it's caffeinated folk uh, <laughs> and 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 so there's kind of little drops of trying to contain an atmosphere, an image. Well, I mean, you've teed it up perfectly with this idea of the portability of water yeah. and introducing Sakis and translation and the context of writing. So I wonder then in relationship to this water in Greece and water in London, yeah. like how are these waters intermingling in the book or are they separate or are they... Is any London water, English water? Okay, okay, this there? is a big okay. question because are there, is it, is it just one water or are there are other waters? Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I, I know this is kind of a stupid theoretical thing and I'm really trying to understand whether we can talk about one water or, or several other waters. I was reading this interview by um, this French, um, um, so a world sailor, she sailed three times around the globe, Isabelle Latissier or something like that. She wrote a book on Venice actually, uh, called Le, Le Naufrage de Venise or something like that. And, uh, but she's also like a worldwide fund uh, sort of director or something. And she was saying, Earth should not be called Earth, should be called Sea. Mm. And it's quite wonderful because in Greek, there is this word called Idrogios, which means Idro, Idro, which is water, and Yeah, which is Earth. 
So there is this beautiful word, I, I, I don't know whether it's been translated into Greek or into English or anyone can help, but it's this just very beautiful concept of the water globe rather than an earth globe. There's still earth there, but it's, so I think it's, it, it really goes to the cultural imagination that we, you know, we've been brought up. I was brought up next to the sea by the sea promenade in Thessaloniki, etc. And when I first arrived in, in, uh, in London, I used to go to the Barbican for places <laughs> to get my water dosage. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, because it, it, it had the kind of water that I wanted, kind of uh, limited, um, safe. I'm, I'm shit scared of water as well. I mean, like, I kind of, you know, deep water and all that stuff. So this is kind of an exercising exercise. Uh, the, the fear of water as well as the awe mm. and the, the desire for water and all that stuff. So Barbican was the perfect kind of moment of impasse. You can't go across, private property and blah 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 and all that stuff, but also water. Uh, green, yeah. 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 Uh, murky and, um, and modernist. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because it's the enclosure. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Well, this. Well, in the in in a few of the stories, this idea of drawing a line in water mm. comes up. Right? Yeah. So this kind of desire to control it yeah. in some ways. Yeah. And, and another in another story as well as geometry. So there's right. like not just the enclosure, but a kind of way of being able to comprehend mm. these many waters, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. For Sonaliki's water is very what, different from. For you, are there? Is there one water or are there many waters? Many. I don't really. Th by the kind of world, the, like one ocean or one okay. theory. I think wherever you encounter it, it's different. You know? Whether it's a puddle outside or in the deep sea, it's a, yeah. it's a different kind of water, even if it's in circulation. But what's the continuum? What's the connection between them? Then? Well, they're in circulation, but they, okay. they're constantly transforming. Yeah? No? But if they're transforming, it's the same thing, isn't it? They're just transforming into different into things. Into different things. Oh my God, this is Venice again. <laughs> Usually this goes with copious amounts of wine too. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. maybe you should have a sip. <laughs> Oh, I should. Anyway, um, yeah, so I don't know. I think maybe, do, should we carry on? Or do you want to... Should we carry on? No, no, we shouldn't carry on. Should we see how this yeah. fits into this, the story you told in the book? We have fits one, into ongoing yeah, we have projects. One, we have one little thing. Um, and this is, um, you know, my gratitude to Danielle Arnaud for hosting this event is enormous. And it will never stop, thank you. Um, but also my gratitude for really believing in me and what I can do and all that stuff and because I don't so somebody has to uh, dad are you listening so uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and so in in a month's time um, Robert Ferreira who, who is you uh, uh, very hello uh, uh, and I are putting on an exhibition here quite a multidisciplinary exhibition um, text sound uh, sculpture, painting, performance, and um, and in a sense, this was like a warming up of the space. Uh, we're very, very happy to be amongst Abraham's beautiful, beautiful art, which is very delicate, by the way. So don't don't go drunk, happy, pushing things. Um, and uh, and and our exhibition is right after this, and so instead of. Um, so the exhibition is based on another novel, on a, on a novel I wrote, uh, again about water. It's called Our Distance Became Water. And um, uh, I, Robert composed music, soundscape for this. Um, and, uh, and we thought that we could play... Uh, I can't. Uh, we can play one, one part, which is uh, only three minutes. Um, for, for the show that's going to take place here. Um, and it, the book is all about uh, a city that floods. Uh, the, the water arrives on the second floor of all buildings. Uh, there are two lovers who have invited the water into the relationship before the flood, um, physically and metaphysically. Um, and um, there's a bit of action too, not just philosophy and visuals. <laughs> Shall I? This, this was left of our city, a manic precarity jutting out of a liquid smoothness, desperately trying to stay up, erect, glimmering. But the glow of glass and metal has been overshadowed by the flatness of the waters already invading the second floors of most large buildings. The old imperial dream about concentration of colonial size and capitalist survival 
is slowly sinking. Its foundations have now been replaced by aquatic life. Unexplained sudden gurgles, steady corrosion, liquidity. The first to go were the deep basements, two, three levels below the ground of the large mansions in the smart areas of the city. Private cinemas and gyms started flooding from within, the water surging from the underfloor heating outlets and those hatches that neatly hide laptop plugs. Next were the swimming pool levels, the penumbra of filtered natural light and mood illuminations. Neither quite basement, nor ground floor. As if emboldened, the pool water started rising, their fastidious cleanliness mixed with that ubiquitous green shade, by now affecting the colours of the whole city. Not just green, of course, tongues of pearly blackness, multicoloured ribbons of assaulting perseverance, clouds of unearthly brownness. The underground tunnels were being washed out, soot and dirt amassed during centuries of digging and hiding, now moving up, mixing with the wetness of pools and humid doors. Bloated sewers made life unbearable during those first months. The muck and the stench were bad enough. But what was truly intolerable was the way this urban burping haunted everyone's dreams, from the youngest to the oldest. Blobby monsters that trembled like oil spills. Their sorts of things passed. Done and dusted, one would think. Ostracized excreta. Pulsing with memories, guilt, missed opportunities. All these wounds on the fabric of our self-possession bloomed wildly during the first few months. After the basements, it was a short gulp till public fountains, paddling lakes and navigable canals would start rising initially playfully, an open invitation to children and overworked adults to dip in toes and fingers and indulge for a moment in the positives of this soaring chaos. The very first act of the local government, initially rendered helpless by that wave of anxiety that paralysed all structures, was to try and switch off the fountains where they saw that the water spurting out of them turned seaweed green, thick with bacteria and other forms of undesired life. But it didn't work. The gurgling force coming from below was impossible to contain. And anyway, it was only a matter of time. To all these were also covered by that flat stillness, whose only motion was an imperceptible but voracious upwards. <laughs>